we like to call it the supernatural hour. And now, our hosts. Hey everybody, it is another episode of the Supernatural Hour. I'm your host, Castle. We've got your host, Lurch. Sup? we got Beaker. What's happening? We've got Peaches. Hello, hello. We have got Silent Dawn. Hello. And we've got Granny Cinnamon. Hello. I told you before the show started that I'm going to throw you under the bus, Castle. <laughs> I was prepared to talk about the subject matter that we're talking about tonight, but you derailed me and we talked about like uh, modern funerary practices. Uh, today it's going to be more of like a history starting with uh, you know the early, early starts of uh, funeral directing, but... I have so many projects going on, on my laptop that uh, I left it at home, so I'm reciting all of this from memory, so if I do mess up any facts, I'm going to blame Gary, because I was fully prepared last week. It's all the history, starting with like the Egyptians, Romans, Greeks, into the Norse, into uh, medieval England, and then colonial America, into what we have now, see, and, my and you favorite. can kind of see how it builds up off of each other. Go ahead, Deanna. I was going to say, my favorite is the Victorian stuff, the stuff I've read about the Victorian funeral Taking Stuff. pictures of dead people? Yeah. Yeah, with anyway, dead people? We shall not jump forward, but that's my favorite. So at what point are we going to start this? Shortly after they got kicked out of the garden, or are we going to jump forward a few hundred No, I, I think the, uh, the, the first point that I want to start off on would be the, uh, the ancient Egyptians, because I think they're probably the most coolest um, with their funerary practices. Of course, we know all about mummification. The actual process that you've seen like in uh, museums of like Tutankhamun and other mummies, that actual process was only done by less than 1% of the population in Egypt. It was a very expensive, very time-consuming practice to, uh, uh, to, to go through all the steps. Um, only the, the really rich, the really super elite would have uh, the full mummification process done to them. Um, after after death, you know, they'd be transported to a uh, like a holy temple. Uh, and the the weird thing too is like the priests that would uh, do the mummification. Um, it was kind of like a caste system back in the day, and the priests were were holy people uh, because a lot of the mummification process dealt with religion. You know, they're a, a multi god culture. And uh, so they believed all these things with their religion and about mummification. The whole mummification process be, uh, stems from the fact that they believed in their religion that when the soul uh, left the body after death, it made a 2,000 year voyage uh, around the sun and back again. And when it returned, it would have to return to its body. And so the, the thought behind it was that they had to preserve the body so that it would look good enough that the soul would recognize and it'd be able to reunite with itself. So. <coughs> Uh, that's basically, in a nutshell, where the mummification process started in Egypt. But like I said, the full process with uh, where they would be taken by priests, uh, the body would be washed, there would be oils, spices, uh, they would open up the chest cavity, they would remove all of the, the viscera, all of the organs. Uh, they had what were called canopic jars. Uh, they were jars, uh, like uh, clay jars that had... It was a set of four jars, and each jar had a different head of a different god. Really quickly before you get off of that subject, we recently were watching this um, show on, you know, ancient Egypt, and it wasn't per se about the funeral process, but yeah, just everything. But they recently uncovered, and I don't know how recently, I don't know how old the, it was on YouTube, I don't know how old the, the movie was, but in the last five-ish years or so, um, a chamber where they did this the mummification process and they actually found jars that were labeled and it, it mm -hmm. was like the you know the the doctor's office as it were yep um and there's actually a museum or they're, or they're getting ready to put it into a museum sadly i think it's in egypt but i think that would be fascinating and they're they're so excited to find out you know even more exact how this process was and you know the chemicals that they actually used and anyway I'm yeah, done. it was uh, it was very thorough. It usually took several weeks to actually mummify a body. Uh, they would, uh, like I said, they would wash and anoint the body with oils and spices. They would remove the viscera. They believed that the soul lived in the heart, so the heart was a very important organ. It had a special canopic jar to itself. There were jars that were set aside for different parts of the uh, the internal organs, but each of the jars had a different 
uh, god on them that represented something about the, the afterlife and it had all significance but uh they didn't believe that the brain did anything so they literally i'm sure you've heard stories about that they would literally take uh, a rod and put it into the nasal cavity and using like a, a hammer would break the sinus and then kind of like use that metal rod to swizzle stick the uh, the brain and then pull it out through the nose so they they, they, mm. they didn't realize the brain was you know where you know all of the thought process came from and they didn't believe that it had any use at all so just as part of like the the preservation process they would remove that and uh it had very little significance um but uh, a lot of the processes uh just involved desiccation drying out the body um using all kinds of spices honey flowers herbs uh there would be you know the body would be filled back up with like herbs and and spices and flowers and honey and and different things and it would all be very well put together and it's very uh very detailed of course i don't have my notes in front of me right now so i can't get into too much depth but uh just what i remember um just multi multi layers of uh doing little things like they would actually take thread and sew the uh, the fingernails back on so they wouldn't fall off but again that was only for like less than one percent of the population most people when they died uh they would first be laid out in the sun so they would dry and then they would be brined basically in a, a bath of, of of salt and that would take uh, several weeks as well so most of the population in egypt they if they were mummified it was just laying them out in the sun turning them into uh people jerky How's mm. that for an image? Mmm, tasty. <laughs> By the way, you might not want to be eating during this podcast. This is a post-breakfast podcast. Um, yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that, how they did the common man. Now, I know they yeah. buried... Uh, like and they had different levels, too. It's like it, it was all very expensive, um, or there's different levels of, uh, of price ranges. But yeah, for the most part, most people would just get dried in salt and desiccated in the sun because, you know, Egypt is a very hot place. And uh, and they're just wrapped up loosely and maybe some linens if they could afford it. And that was that was pretty much it. So with the common man, I know like r- Egyptian royalty, they got buried under these huge pyramids and these really elaborate tombs. What would they do with the common man? I mean, after they got them all dried out, they just like stick them in the tool shed in the backyard or... You know, I honestly can't remember. I think uh, they might have done some sort of burial, uh, but I honestly don't know. Um, I can't recall that. Um, so that's a good question. I'll have to follow up with you on an answer on that. Okay. Uh, so what do you got next for us? Oh, so after the Egyptians, you know, uh, that practice kind of spread a little bit north across the Mediterranean into uh, ancient Greek and, and ancient Rome. And a lot of those two cultures are kind of similar, but they also have some very unique, uh, differing things, that, differing practices that they did. The Greeks... Uh, they they started burials uh, there or they not started it but they they practiced burials more uh, frequently um, they would actually um, uh, they, they would actually you know have tombs that they they built rock crypts where they would bury people they would have uh, mass graves where they would bury people they they had a necropolis it was a city of the dead is the the precursor to the the modern cemetery and that would usually be outside the city walls and uh, they would have a a large gathering, like a, a modern funeral procession, where they would leave the city and they would be carrying the the deceased on a. It was called a bier, b i e r, and it was kind of like a uh, uh, a pallet where they would carry the body and uh, carry it out to the necropolis. They would have the the burial out there. They would actually the wealthy would also hire um, professional mourners, and the mourners would would wail and gnash their teeth and rip their clothes off and pull their hair out and showing showing grief like that was the way that they showed respect for the person so the more grief the more people wailed and and grieved over that person the more beloved they were Uh, again just kind of a a strange practice you wouldn't really hire mourners today professional mourners come to your cemetery or go to your your funeral service and and cry for you but that's basically what they did was they they would hire people to uh, to cry at their cemetery, at their their funeral services. I am a top tier mourner. I can try at the drop of a hat. I charge <laughs> forty five dollars an hour. And <laughs> the, the Greek would also usually bury their their dead within the day. Um, so if someone died that morning, they would have the burial that day before sunset or around sunset. So it was a very quick process. 
Um, and then also the, the Romans kind of practiced a little bit of that too, but the Romans were really known for um, the, uh, the cremation process that they did. They, they were the ones to really make that more of a common practice. Um, a lot of their, their warriors, they would uh, just build pyres on the actual battlefield, huge uh, piles of wood, and throw the, uh, the dead onto that and uh, have huge bonfires and uh, cremate the, the people that had died in battle. That one actually, to me, is kind of interesting because that almost seems like it's more practical than anything. It is. Uh, because, I mean, you look at a battlefield like Gettysburg where you got, you know, tens of thousands of dead. You don't have time uh, to bury everyone. Yeah, by the, even at your best attempt, you have some pretty serious stink on your hands uh, before you can get a, a hole in the ground for everybody. And you think about some of... Uh, some of these battles where like tens of thousands of people died in a day and it was bloody and uh you know it was just is it, it was just a way of keeping the the vultures from from eating the carrion from eating the uh the the body of their their fallen well it also soldiers. seems like a way to help prevent spread of uh disease, disease from absolutely. Uh, the rotting corpses absolutely so that one's kind of to me is fascinating just from the practicality standpoint of it boy we are just burning through these really fast <laughs> Well, it's been like five minutes now. This will be our supernatural five minute show. I know, right? <laughs> like I said, I uh, that's all right. Yeah, we're we're good. We're yeah. Good. Um, so uh, yeah, the Romans they they were the ones that kind of uh, I guess originated cremation in a way. They were the ones that practiced it the most in uh, in any of the ancient societies. Uh, but that uh, practice kind of spread north up into the Scandinavian countries. A lot of the Norse. A lot of the Vikings, of course, you've probably heard about, like, the Viking burials where, awesome. uh, yeah, those are pretty cool, where they would put their uh, brethren into a, uh, a boat and fill it with a lot of their possessions, a lot of their loved ones, or not loved ones, but uh, belongings. Um, oftentimes, if someone had, like, a horse that was, uh, you know, their property or a dog, they would, uh, when that person died, they would also kill the horse, they would kill the dog and uh, send it on its way with that soldier to Valhalla. But uh, basically they would just put someone in a boat and uh, kick them off the shore. And as the at, and it was done usually at sunset. And as the boat started to get away, uh, they would launch flaming arrows into the boat and set it on fire. And the saying is that if the color of the fire matched the same color of the sunset, then that person lived a very honorable life. And they were welcome into the, the gates of Valhalla uh, with open arms, but uh, again, a lot of the things that they had in life, they would send on their way with them. Um, it wasn't always uh, those traditional Viking burials, though. A lot of times, they would uh, they would have you know more quote unquote traditional burials where they would dig a hole and put the person in there. But again, um, if they had a horse, the horse would be euthanized. The, it would be killed. If they had a hound, that dog would be killed too. They would put. Uh, the person's, you know, armor in there, have them fully dressed in their armor. Uh, they would have their belongings, their weapons, uh, just little things like that, just to signify that, you know, these are their, their belongings. And, and it had something to do with uh, coming back and, and having those things reunited with them, or having them with them in the afterlife also. I think it also was a part that family didn't fight over stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> uh, you, you don't you don't hope for for dad to die because when he dies, all the stuff's going in with him. It's not a matter of what I get. And it's funny that you bring that up because as a funeral director, I have seen that happen so many times, so many times where people have had little family rifts, and when someone dies, it's literally a, a scrabble for for power for for material items like you know he's dead i get this i want this i want that and that wedge in that family either gets kind of healed by the death or it gets driven even further and families become even more separated because they squabble over just small material items like you know i i i deserve his car i deserve his house and i've seen families just wrecked because of deaths, because of uh, their 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 parents passing away, and well, and their parents passing away without without a will, without a will, and what, exactly, and, and even down to the the some of the things that you really wouldn't even think to put in a will. Yeah, exactly. You know, household items. It's like people yeah. fighting over TVs, it's and it's my, like this is my vintage Star Wars collection. I'm taking it. You know, just it's ridiculous. Yeah. Well, Luke's just gonna be buried with his vintage Star Wars. Collection. I certainly <laughs> am. I've told my wife, you know, my plans. 
within the next few years are to actually build a uh, stormtrooper costume. Uh, you know, vacuum formed and everything. I even told my wife, you know, if I ever do that, I wouldn't mind being buried in my stormtrooper co- costume. Uh, of course, that'll probably never happen. But his wife is just smiling, kind of nodding, nodding, going, "Oh yeah." And the minute he dies, that thing's going right out of the dumpster. See, her her thoughts are like, "Well, what about like your, you know, here in Utah, we're we're mostly LDS and we wear garments. You know, they're they're kind of like a, a shield and protector. It's kind of like our underwear." And uh, she's like, well, what about your garments? Oh, I can have my garments underneath my uh, Stormtrooper costume, too. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, what about your, you know, just the, the burial practices that we do here? A little bit uh, a little bit outside of the mainstream of most of the U.S., I think. So now, after uh, after the Norse, what, what do we got? There's something else, though. A lot of the Norse, too, um, They, I think they were the first to really uh, think of the concept of zombies. Uh, about their dead coming back to life, and so what would happen a lot of times too is Just if they put didn't a bolt in the head right before they send it on the close, ship. close. If they didn't have time to bury someone or to build a pyre, they would literally chop the head off of the deceased because they thought, you know, if we leave the head on, they're they're going to come back to life and they're going to come back and kill us. They're going to they're going to haunt us and and kill us ourselves. So they would after the body was dead, they would literally. Uh, What's what's the word I'm thinking of? Decapitate. Uh, decapitate. Yeah, well, n- not decapitate, but also like uh, uh, defile, defile the body, make it so that the the body wouldn't be able to return. Like if if the spirit came back into it, it wouldn't be able to stand up and and wield a sword and kill yourself. So, yeah, pretty interesting stuff. But yeah, the Norse were pretty cool in that regards. Uh, I kind of liked the idea of uh, of having them with. I mean, it, I know it sounds morbid, but I think I mentioned on the last episode that uh, even even in, in some of the modern funeral services that I've done, people have been buried with pets, whether it's been cremated remains of a pet, um, or I think I even mentioned there was one lady that passed away. She had a dog, <laughs> and the dog was elderly, but the family actually had the dog euthanized. They kept the dog on ice in the freezer in a plastic bag for a week or two until the funeral service and then the day of the viewing you know they came in as a family and and wanted to see mom in her casket by herself before uh the rest of the the viewing started and they brought the dog they brought in this freezer pop uh pupsicle and (laughs) they opened up the foot of the casket put the dog in the foot of the casket no one knew that it was there of course i did but you know i i i would always tell people i I, I can turn a blind eye. What the less I know, the better. But I've seen people put cremated remains of animals in a casket with someone. I've seen this pupsicle go in a casket. I've I've seen people. There is one dude I think I mentioned as well. He was kind of a dirty old man, and uh, they they put a bottle of whiskey in one hand and a Playboy magazine in the other because that's what he did. He drank and he looked at porn. So. <laughs> You know? <laughs> well, and I've been to, um, you know, e- Egyptian mummy exhibits where they've got, um, you know, mummified cats and mummified mm-hmm. uh, falcons, and, and those were pretty interesting. Yeah, and I, I, shoot, I'm drawing a blank. There's actually a society here in Salt Lake, and they have, I'm, I'm sure if someone were to Google it, um, they have a like a pyramid temple in downtown Salt Lake. It's only like 30 feet tall right by fear factory yes and i can't remember the name of the religion but i worked with a guy who uh who practiced that religion and it was another it was a modern day uh mummification only it was even more extreme they would have the the final step would be to have this person placed in a sarcophagus and then to have this clear plastic resin poured over them and it was so durable that he said you could take like a jackhammer to it and it would take you hours just to like chisel out a little bit. So this this body would be like thoroughly preserved. I mean, with like the the modern uh, technology that we have with, uh, you know, how, how chemical reactions work and, and chemistry and, and thanatochemistry, the, de- uh, the science of, of dying and everything, they, they took that and incorporated that with the old uh, ancient Egyptian mummification practices and kind of squashed the two together and so they uh they they incorporated all that and would do like a, a modern day mummification it literally cost thousands of dollars but again it's just part of their 
beliefs now in this uh, religion. Yeah, that's, I, what, that's, I, what, that's what I'm going to do when Tim dies. I'm going to have Tim encased in a block of lucite, kind of like other scorpions you see at the convenience store and the suckers. Nice. Who says I'm dying before you? And then we're going to put. I'm going to bury Tim with a, a subway foot long. That's called murder. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you you you're not supposed to bury people that are still alive. Well, no, you'd be encased in the... Do you want to know what it's called? You know, yes. Rock candy. I actually right. took a picture of that yeah. because candy. we got to Fear Factory a little early, so we were just driving around, and we thought it was interesting. But I didn't have the picture anymore, but it's called Summum. Summum. That's it. Yeah, Summum. So, yeah, two of the, the guys I used to work with, they, they were at the same location together, but they both practiced Summum. And uh, the, the older of the two, he would go to the temple... Uh, weekly and they would have like meditation and and you know it was, was kind of secretive they didn't reveal a whole lot but they would uh, they would drink wine together as like a, a sacrament and they would uh, meditate together in this the pyramid but yeah again kind of similar along to the ancient Egyptians they had these thoughts that you know of uh, of resurrection and preserving the body but it was it was really thorough I remember uh, the the younger of the two gentlemen kind of uh, I, I picked his brain one day and I asked him you know what what exactly do you guys do and he went into full detail and it was it was just like mummification where there's spices and the body's anointed and wrapped up in linen and cloths and and bandages but also placed into a sarcophagus and then having this clear liquid resin poured over you so it's literally you're you're ziplocked your your flavor sealed so I'm gonna get hate mail for this but that religion almost sounds like a redneck word some of them. I'm going to summon me a demon. <laughs> some of them. I'm going to summon me a demon. <laughs> Tim at Tim's big thing dot com. Um, So let me ask you, from a funeral director standpoint, um, I know that you have to be licensed to yes. go through years of schooling to be yes. messing around with bodies and pumping chemicals into them. Yes. How, does, how do these folks that some of them get away with pouring lucite? It's, it's the same sort of thing. I mean, you, you basically... you. Uh, before anything is done in a funeral home, you have to sign waivers. It's it's all about protecting yourself uh, from litigation. So before anything is ever done, especially with cremation, I would have families sign multiple uh, waivers and like go through every point by point. Like this is what we're gonna do, and then I need your initials here, and then this is the next step, and I need your initials here, and just explain the whole cremation process because cremation is irreversible. Um, duh. Death kind yeah. of what? is too. <laughs> Death kind are of you, is too. Wait, are you saying once you burn something, you can't unburn you it? You cannot unburn it. Yeah, That's, this is news to me. Can't, I know. Can't right? have to re- rethink some life decisions here. <laughs> so, newsflash: There have been, you know, funeral homes that have cremated the wrong person. Mm. We yeah, talked about that last time, where yeah. they cremated living people. <laughs> right. It's a little awkward. Yeah. So no, it's all a system of checks and balances. Even before the cremation actually happens, you're going through about seven or eight different uh, checks and balances. I would have my paperwork reviewed by someone else to make sure that I had all the necessary paperwork, that I had the death certificate uh, validated, that I had all the signatures gathered by the family, that I had the. Uh, uh, cremation date and time reserved. I mean, everything. It was it was very very thorough. And then you would even like check the person two or three times to make sure you have the right person. You have a, a little name tag on them, and and you would check that, make sure the numbers match up with the person in the casket and with the uh, all the numbers on the paperwork. So it's it's very thorough. You you don't want to cremate the wrong person. Well, so let's say you did though. Let's say if someone cremates the wrong body, <laughs> I mean, can like they the family like sue? Oh the, yeah. Oh yeah, you're looking at a major, major multi-million dollar lawsuit, uh, both uh, you know in court, and they could pursue like a civil case as well. I mean, that's uh, there's so much potential for litigation if so you mess something up. I would just open up a funeral home then and be like, we do nothing but cremation. And there are funeral homes that do that too. Oh well, then I not do not have an original That's idea. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm gonna make a lot of money. And Never you know, mind. Utah actually kind of lives in a bubble too because. Uh, um, on a nationwide scale, cremation is now the the most practiced, the most uh, common form of uh, of, of uh, you burial. Know, bur- and it's not burial, but interment. Uh, interment. Thank you. That's what I was trying to think of. Uh, it's the most common practice uh, in Utah. I think we're still at about seventy percent for burials, which what? means that about uh, seven out of ten cases 
that come through Utah, they're, they're traditional burials. The person's embalmed, they have a viewing, they have a full traditional burial with a casket. But everywhere outside the U.S., you're looking at like 70 or 80% for cremation. It's even higher in, in some of the southern states. Louisiana, I want to say it's like 80 or 90% cremation. So very few people are actually being buried, outside, buried in the ground outside of Utah. When I say I think it was back in the 1960s, uh, cremation was very rare. It was. Until the 60s. Uh, from a religious standpoint, I believe that the Catholic Church really frowned on it, mm -hmm. as did. Not anymore, though. Not right. Anymore. I was going to yeah. say, it's about the 60s where the Catholic Church said, you know what, it's, if God can make you, he can put you back together. And then it, the trend started to shift from uh, just a single-digit percentage getting cremated uh, to, like you said, now it's almost 70% outside of Utah. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. So. And being here in Utah, too, I think that's why there's a little bit of that bubble, because I think a lot of the Latter-day Saints here in Utah, they they believe that uh, the the body has to remain intact. But, you know, you have members of our church that are outside of the, the country, like in China or Japan, where it's uh, a government, it's, it's required by law that the person is cremated. So, you know, our church doesn't frown upon it either, but there was a lot of confusion. People thought that uh, you had to be buried, like cremation was frowned upon by, by our church as well. I but think that's not true. I think the thought is, is that the body's more or less a temple or a tabernacle, and in many people's minds it's desecrating. Well, It'd be like setting a, a torch to a to a church, essentially. But like you said, it's really not an issue. And again, it comes down to the fact that if God can make us, I'm pretty sure he can put us back together again. And restore every get. single hair on our head. So, Tim, technically things can be unburned. But the the funny thing is, We too, are is not that Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> Cremation is essentially a expedited version of what will happen to us eventually. Even with embalming, it is a temporary preservation process. But even over several hundred years, uh, the, the body is going to decompose basically down into dust, which is what cremation does. It does that in, in a matter of hours instead of uh, hundreds of of days or so it or makes years. more fiscally sense. It's very more to fiscally do sense do sound. Do cremate than it is to Absolutely. do all that of yeah. all that space you're saving Ex and that's another thing too yeah. is that um you don't have to buy property you don't have to buy a plot to bury someone if you're having them cremated so you're saving about four or five thousand dollars there you don't have to buy a casket um when you get the remains back you can hold on to them you can do whatever you want there's a lot of really cool options we talked about this last time about <laughs> how you could have your cremated remains put into a um, a large like sack or something and it has like a uh, a tree nut in it you could be yeah, planted as urns. a tree bio urn. urns exactly yeah, bio urns that's what I'm doing you can be dumped at Pirates of the Caribbean yeah. in Disneyland now, yeah <laughs> <laughs> and I know you can you can bury ashes because I've played um Pipes yep. at funerals where there's just this little teeny bitty hole. Exactly. You can bury most things. Well, I mean, really. you don't just <laughs> have to be on, in an urn on grandma's. Yeah. According to science, though, like the earth is doomed to be non existent, I guess, or f less lack of life. Like 13 million years. So anything oh, that's man. buried here is going to be wiped out by solar flares anyway. That's somebody else's problem. That's um, it's, yeah, I won't be around in 13 million years. So. <laughs> I want to do, do that thing that Kenny was talking about on Radio Ronin a couple weeks back where they like take the bodies. And I know we kind of talked about this in the past where on a previous episode where they take like the dead family member and like pose them and take pictures and stuff. Uh, but apparently this is a, a thing that's like coming back. And oh, really? Yeah, they, they were. Kenny was talking about how... Uh, like one funeral, they, the 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 boy died, and he loved playing video games when he was alive. Oh. So they did like a little setup at the church. Yeah, like at the funeral, like the, he was just sitting there, like he was playing video games, and you can go like sit next to him and have like a little chat with him and stuff like that. And yeah, I've that's I've actually like, seen like extreme embalming. I think is what they call it or something like yeah. that. Like that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be sitting there like. No, it's just the Victorian stuff coming back because that's what they used to do. That's yeah, what I with just said. But I know, but I'm saying it again. But uh. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't seen that personally, but I've seen like video and photo footage of other funeral homes doing that. I know that out east, uh, there was a photo that I saw many years ago, um, and it, this guy was a Steelers fan, and uh, they literally had him embalmed in a position so that they could place him into his favorite easy chair, and he had all of his Steelers clothes on, and they placed him in front of a TV that was replaying like a Steelers football game, and it, it was actually kind of cool. 
the you know like weekend at Bernie's, the weekend at Bernie's type yeah, of thing. I won't you know? do that, but like you know, I'm up, I'm like investigating a venue or something. I've heard of people being buried in their car, where they actually uh, you know had the person sitting upright at the steering wheel in their Cadillac, and they they purchased several plots so they could actually put the the Cadillac into the ground you know you think about the size of that and the size of a casket well and, and the, each plot space and the grip that you've got to get for it the, you're, the you're, cement yeah. vault you're buying several hundred dollars worth of, of, of plot space yeah of. you're buying like multiple plots and they would literally dig out all those plots so they could put the the cadillac with the guy in there into the ground and that was basically his casket that's ridiculous you know, if, if we extreme embalm tim and he wants to be uh, set up like he's investigating that could be kind of fun because I'd be there with like my K2 and I'd sit on his lap like, hey Tim, if you're here, move your pinky. One of my favorite places that I've ever been to, uh, I went on a trip when I was a funeral director to uh, Louisiana for a uh, funeral director's convention. I want to say it was like 2012 or 2010 in New Orleans and we flew in and uh, me and the, uh, the other people that were there at the convention, you could go on like an excursion and they had a cemetery tour. And I got to say that was one of the coolest things. We went to the uh, the the old cemeteries right there in the French Quarter, the above I, ground. Yeah, uh, we went a little bit northeast of Louisiana of, of New Orleans to Kenner, and they have a huge cemetery out there. And all of the crypts, I mean, everything is above ground. So you're looking at this huge multi, you know, 200, 400 acre cemetery, and everywhere there's these gorgeous granite crypts. And everyone's uh, buried in them, and and it was just fascinating walking around, looking at all the different styles of crypts, and those are like tens of thousands of dollars. But most people, they uh, they have family crypts, um, like in in the older cemeteries, uh, they they put the body into the the crypt space, and the heat uh, in the south, and and being in that confined space will actually cremate that body over the course of several months. And so you get the, you've heard the saying, I wouldn't touch that with 10 foot pole, because what they would do is at the very back of the crypts, uh, when the body was cremated, uh, you know, over time, over a year or so, that plot would be, or that crypt space would be used again for another family member. So they would literally take a 10 foot pole to like brush all the stuff to the back of the crypt and it would go into a hole and into the ground, where it's like a communal, uh, cremated remains space and they would just literally push everything to the back and it would go away and then they put the next family member in there and just reuse that same crypt space for several generations for several people oh interesting i say and a lot of the reason too that they do all the above ground burials in that part of the country is because the groundwater level they're, is so high they're six you, feet you underwater level yeah and so you can't reasonably dig a six foot hole in the ground without having a pond um yeah you can't bury i mean you you dig a few inches down you're hitting water um, I remember as a kid, we had, we actually, I grew up in, or I lived for a couple years uh, in Kenner, uh, Louisiana, the place where I, I visited the cemetery. And I, I remember running across my backyard and seeing like the ground kind of wobble a little bit because they had like these big wooden tiles in the backyard. You didn't have a lawn, but we had these big wooden tiles. And I remember kind of running across it and then looking back behind me and seeing the the tiling kind of wobble a little bit because you're literally you're under sea level crazy stuff so now we've talked about the norse we've talked a little about cremation stuff and the romans we probably need to wrap this up we will call this an episode you've been listening to the supernatural hour at advancedparanormal.com the supernatural hour is part of the radio ronin network found at radioronin.com copyright by advanced paranormal services